Hi everyone, I'm back! That ain't the invisible cunt. So my recent video responding to Philosophy Tube about the housing market got a lot more attention than I expected. Huh? What the heck? I want you to know that even though I wasn't able to respond to every comment, I am reading them and I am listening. Most of the feedback was positive and the criticism was constructive. Then there were some other comments. Anyway, thanks so much guys, and if you're new, then welcome to part 2 of my series on BreadTube and economics. If you missed part 1, it's in the description. But I'm gonna break standard YouTube protocol and say that you don't need to watch it before you watch this one, as it's about a separate subject. But watching the first part will still increase my views and release precious precious dopamine into my system, so do it I guess. Today we're going to talk about nationalisation and privatisation of utilities, with special reference to the case of trains in the UK. The bread tuber we're going to constructively critique is Sean Skull, and his video on how privatisation of railways fails. I want to stress from the outset that Sean's video isn't too bad, actually I think it's quite good. Because of that, this video started as an addendum to my previous one, but it turns out I had a lot to say. I'm shocked, shocked. Overall, I'd say that Sean's account of privatisation of the railways is more incomplete than wrong, because although he gives a solid critique of privatisation, he doesn't make a good enough case for nationalisation or consider alternative models. This is something that a few commenters noticed. He also misses a couple of points which I think would help his case, as we'll see. Another thing I found interesting was that Sean said this. But this video is going to be the first, I hope, of a larger semi-regular series in which I'll be giving a basic overview of various problems with capitalist economies. But as far as I can see, he didn't go on to do this. Is it because he felt like he didn't know enough economics? Or is it because he got distracted replying to a litany of absolute morons? Who knows? Either way, we're here to fill the gap. Before we get into Sean's video, I want to bring in a couple of key ideas from economics that he misses. Firstly, natural monopoly, and secondly, spillovers. Economists define a natural monopoly as an industry with very high startup costs, but low running costs. It goes without saying that train tracks and trains themselves are hugely expensive, but the cost of each train journey, once you've already got these, is not so high. Most trains have only two workers on them, the driver and the conductor, so labour costs are low. The high cost of starting a train company means that few firms are going to be able to enter the market, which inhibits competition. Natural monopoly means that as a society, we're likely to be stuck with large organisations running our trains, and the question is how we manage this. We'll return to this point later. Our second key concept is positive spillovers, where the social gains of an industry outweigh the private gains. The benefits of rail are spread quite diffusely throughout the community. When there's a train in an area, local businesses and residents gain through increased activity, employment and house prices. These benefits don't usually go to the organisation running the trains, and passenger fares are usually insufficient to fund the railway, especially on the less travelled routes. Positive spillovers mean that taken narrowly, the organisations running the railways are likely to be loss-making. The nationalised companies that used to run the trains were loss-making, with British Rail losing £104 million in 1962. The private companies running the trains now are largely loss-making and have to be subsidised by the government. Despite this, trains and other utilities used to be thought of as a net gain for everyone else because of the benefits railways provided for the community. Although the rail companies made a loss, society gained, or so the logic went. Rediscovering this idea of trains and transport as a foundation for the economy, not to mention society, shifts our focus from whether or not the individual companies make a profit. So, what we have here are a couple of ideas which, taken together, seem to suggest the need for some degree of state involvement, both to boost funding and to counteract monopoly. One way of harnessing the diffuse benefits to pay for the investment would be a land tax, which you may remember if you watched my previous video. Don't worry, Georgists, I'm with you. There are dozens of us! Dozens! This idea has even been put into practice with the railway and property model used by the Hong Kong Mass Transit Railway System. They lease out land for both commercial and residential purposes and use this to fund their rail. The MTR is widely regarded as effective, cheap, and it also brings in a net profit for the public purse. Now, this might start to seem like an open and shut case. We have some concrete principles and policies which have been shown to work in the real world. I'd love to recommend something like the mass transit railway system in the UK and just leave it there. But one thing which became clear when researching this video is that each country is unique 
and it's not enough to propose one set of policies everywhere. Hong Kong's size, as well as the fact that they started their system almost from scratch, have surely made their approach more effective. Uh, by the way, I'd love to hear about other countries in the comments. The lessons from natural monopoly and spillovers will be useful throughout this video, as they result in us having large and narrowly taken loss-making organisations running the trains. But now we need to learn a little bit more about the context of the UK. So let's return to Sean. Sean's case for nationalisation over privatisation has a hypothetical and an empirical part, and I'm going to deal with them in reverse order for reasons which will hopefully become clear as the video progresses. First, the empirical. Sean goes into detail about the specifics of the UK rail system. He gives a pragmatic account of how the train system works and why this leads to monopoly. For example, uh, The trains in the UK are not owned by the companies that run the trains, you might be surprised to hear. Uh, they're owned by what are called rolling stock companies. And these companies lease the trains to the train operating companies. Uh, the main problem here is that certain trains only work on certain parts of the rail network. There's no point in leasing high-speed trains if you only operate a small part of the network where those trains could never get up to full speed. If you own a high-speed track, there's no point running slow trains down it as they'll block the whole system. Sean also emphasises a few big facts that should be discomforting for fans of privatisation. Firstly, subsidies to the train companies now outstrip the running costs of the old nationalised companies. So it costs more to the state itself to have the privatised system. Score one for the efficiency of the free market. Secondly, despite these costs, UK Rail has poor outcomes. It's low value for money compared to most European countries. A Glasgow to Edinburgh season ticket costs as much as buying an equivalent pass in Germany for the entire rail network. UK trains are also kind of archaic. Rates of electrification are much lower than in European countries. Until recently, one two hour train I took to visit my family didn't even have a toilet. It seems like Mom, a good time. I really, really need to go. I don't think I can hold it. Finally, the privatised system is, to put it bluntly, a rip-off. Sean briefly references a report called The Great Train Robbery, showing that hundreds of millions of pounds are pilfered by the web of private companies that make up the train system. He only mentions the headline, but I'd like to read out a quote from the report to really hammer this point home. The analogy is a nice one, because it brings out the important point that the proceeds of train robbery are in both cases fairly modest sums, which are nevertheless very attractive in terms of reward for effort. The £2.5 million stolen in 1963 had to be divided between more than 15 full gang members, into individual shares of about £150,000, and, after inevitable deductions for safekeeping, None of the gang members was set up for life. Nevertheless, the full share was attractive in terms of reward for risk, because the train gang member's share was much larger than the average smash and grab. Much the same point could be made about the train operating companies. The sum extracted as dividends in any one year is modest in relation to subsidy or operating revenue. In 2011, the dividend amounted to a modest £160 million, against public subsidy of £2.5 billion, and revenue of 7.6 billion. In terms of corporate reward for risk, this is attractive because a train franchise involves an option on profits, with almost no capital required. This is well worth having if it comes good, as it did for Virgin, which has extracted around 500 million pounds over more than 10 years. Having the companies that own the trains be different to the companies that run the trains is dumb on its face, and a source of some of this fraud. Yeah, that's right, I said it. Some. You could eliminate these middlemen, and as the report discusses, the Depart for Transport have recently tried to do this, investing directly in new carriages with the train operating companies. I know what you're thinking. What an incredible conclusion which surely warranted two different videos to come to. Don't worry, we'll get to the more fundamental stuff soon. It's clear that privatisation isn't delivering in its current form. But just because privatisation fails, it doesn't follow that nationalisation works. It could just be that we've tried two different approaches which both kind of suck in their own individual ways. So, just as there are uncomfortable facts for proponents of privatisation, there are some for proponents of nationalisation. I'm not saying these are knockdown arguments against nationalisation, I'm saying that they're points I've seen out there that need to be acknowledged. They are also quite easy to find, so I'm going to have to criticise Sean for not including them in his video at all. You know, I could say something like, Hello everyone. 
Today we're going to be using a lot of Wikipedia, unfortunately. Uh, sorry about this, folks, but some people just want you to do the job for them, I suppose. The first set of... <laughs> The first set of statistics which conflict with calls for nationalisation are passenger numbers over time. It's clear from this graph that more people travelled on the trains when the railways were private, first with the big four companies pre-nationalisation and also ever since reprivatisation. There's a lot going on here beyond just ownership of the rails, including the rise of cars after World War II, but I haven't seen anyone convincingly explain how passenger numbers were low under nationalisation and then rebounded when the trains were reprivatized. Any broader trends apply to other forms of transport, yet trains have always done relatively better under privatization. The second fact is customer service. It's a persistent finding that despite complaints about prices and punctuality, customer satisfaction with the current rail system remains high and has risen over the past 20 years since the trains have been privatized. It's difficult to compare honestly because similar polling data just isn't available for the nationalized period, but anyone who was old enough at the time will tell you that the service in the nationalised system was poor and was heavily criticised. Doing nothing but wasting my time the whole of the time. Been on the train two hours this morning. I never get home till after half past seven at night. We didn't arrive down here until three quarters of an hour late, which means say we miss our buses and we don't arrive home until about an hour and a quarter later than we normally do. Whatever the solution, there have been some punch-ups between commuters and railway staff. Tempers have flared on both sides and one local man was attacked with an umbrella. I mean, British Rail Sandwiches has its own Wikipedia entry. They were that bad. Now, I don't think customer satisfaction is the be-all and end-all, but there is a risk that by ignoring it entirely, us leftists align ourselves with a kind of drab parody of public sector service. Boring buildings, disinterested workers, obscene waiting times and all that. Some days, we don't let the line move at all. We call those weekdays. <laughs> you know, if that's your vision for socialism, then I'm out. Let's move on to the third fact. Accidents and deaths in the two systems. This is also taken from Wikipedia, though in my defence I did a research by putting the raw figures into Excel. That's what four years of a PhD in economics will get you. Shaw makes a lot of play about rail track, the private corporation entrusted to take care of the tracks until the famous Hatfield rail crash, where four people died and many more were injured. To make a long story short, they were rubbish at their jobs and they kept crashing the trains. On this graph you can see Hatfield as the highest orange spike between privatisation and nationalisation. But what you might notice is that Hatfield is far from the only spike. Before privatisation there were two similarly bad crashes, Clapham Junction in 1989 and Cannon Street Station in 1991. I'm not denying that rail track were incompetent and that the Hatfield tragedy was a direct result of that incompetence. But if you look at total deaths and injuries from crashes, there's not a clear difference between the old nationalised system and early privatisation. Speed restrictions and repairs were put in place after Hatfield, which seems to have massively reduced the number of crashes. This is undoubtedly a positive thing, but it doesn't imply state ownership is superior. As Financial Times columnist John Kay says in his reflections on privatisation, Rail track was a badly managed business, but so was British Rail before it. The tracks may have been less safe under rail track than under British Rail, but there is no evidence of this from accident statistics. Yet however inept British Rail was, it was our British Rail. Rail track was not seen in a similar way, and there was no tolerance for its incompetence. So, what can we conclude from these facts? That the situation is nuanced and complicated. In fact, you might be getting suspicious that I'm leading you to a centrist conclusion, which could go something like, the British rail system has a number of systemic problems which aren't easily solved, whether it's privatised or nationalised. We can make changes to parts of the system, but it will always be politically contentious and certainly never perfect. You know, it's all too complicated for you plebs with your incandescent demands to understand. Oh, honey, don't be so naive. That's how the world works. Sure, the mayor takes a few bribes, but he also makes the trains run on time. No, he doesn't. Trains are regulated by the Federal Department of Transportation, and recent studies have shown that, uh... Homer! In a way, it's complicated, but in another, more correct way, it isn't, and there are ready solutions if we're willing to be a bit more creative. Sean's hypothetical case for state ownership is that it's difficult for such an interconnected system as transport to be managed by so many different organisations, so it's better to coordinate it centrally. 
Now, since the system is controlled by the government, they can relatively simply just go ahead and make the changes. In a privatised system, however, making changes is much more complex. Because of the fragmented nature of the privatised network, implementing a change means the government interfacing with potentially dozens of different private companies, all responsible for different parts of the system. This may be true of high-level planning of routes and overall goals such as emissions reductions, but the assumption that bringing the trains into public ownership would automatically alleviate this problem is ill-founded. When researching this video, I've seen time and time again that the problem with British railways, and infrastructure more broadly, relates to governance, not ownership. We saw this with the Hatfield crash. It was actually regulation prompted by public outrage that reduced accidents, which were previously high across both ownership models. The economist Dieter Helm has emphasised that in the UK, we have literally no transport strategy. The state lacks even a system of accounting to keep track of its infrastructure, let alone the capacity to properly manage it. Investment in the railways has therefore been either low or misdirected throughout both the nationalised and privatised periods, leading to bloated costs and inferior outcomes. Helm proposes an independent board which manages and tracks the UK's infrastructure, not just trains. John Kay, who I mentioned before, points to the example of Glass Cymru, an organisation without shareholders which stewards investment into the Welsh water system and has been highly successful at doing so. So centralised governance is the answer to the problems of underinvestment, misinvestment and general planning. But where does this leave us with the ownership and day-to-day -day running of the trains? Helm also proposes that public, private and other organisations should be allowed to bid on the contracts for running the trains. As he points out, there are both successful and unsuccessful examples of all of these types of organisations, both in the UK and outside it. We've certainly seen in this video that they each have their advantages and drawbacks, so limiting the system to any one seems unwarranted. But I want to talk about that other type of organisation mentioned by Helm, something he doesn't really discuss. Despite the song and dance about nationalisation versus privatisation, it's a fact that the process retained many of the same organisations and people, especially at the top. Privatisation actively had to buy out managers of the nationalised enterprises to get them on board, with many of them now enjoying the perks of being in highly profitable private companies. There is a tendency on both the left and right to associate workers and especially unions with the state and to think that nationalisation will do better by them. However, public railways had just as poor labour relations as the private ones, with frequent strikes actually forming part of the rationale for privatisation. The bottom line is that big, top-down organisations are stale and alienating. They're unresponsive to the needs of the people they serve, whether state-owned or corporate-owned. And remember, all managers are bastards. The British politician Tony Benn once pointed out that nationalisation should not be the focal point of leftist politics. Nationalisation does not, of itself, shift the balance of power in society, democratise industry, nor entrench new values in work which will automatically enrich the lives of those in nationalised concerns. Harnessing the collective know-how of rail workers and giving them a stake in these organisations through worker democracy and participation is one alternative to the old ownership models, whether it works alongside or replaces them. There is plenty of favourable evidence showing worker ownership is associated with increased productivity and well-being for workers, but I'm not going to pretend this is specific to trains, and it's worth saving for an in-depth look another time. Ultimately, the history of rail shows that both governance and ownership organisations need to involve not just workers, but civil society, customers, experts and industry. In a podcast for the New Economics Foundation, Hilary Wainwright points out that the nationalised industries in the UK were deliberately not built in a democratic way. The nationalised industries, they were brought into public ownership in a, in a slightly different way, more like for the good of the economy. I mean, it was partly the legacy of the war. That meant that there wasn't the idea of the public, the public purpose, even really fully built into their goals. And in a way, that meant that when they, they came to be run and managed, actually, it, it wasn't considered particularly relevant to involve the public, whether the public was understood as the users and the communities affected, like the mining communities uh, or the passengers of the uh, of the railways nor to involve the, the the workers who were also users Jeremy Corbyn's 2019 manifesto did recognize this with calls for a nationalization for the 21st century aiming to make the process more democratic 
And this leads me to one final point, which I hadn't considered until researching for this video. On the whole, trains are used by the richer sections of society. Poorer people and areas use buses, not trains, something expertly pointed out by the Marxist Tom Haynes Doran. I don't know much about politics, but perhaps one way to both help poorer people and earn their support might be to stop talking about trains quite so much and focus on the transport they actually use. Not only has the left gotten ourselves wrongly obsessed with old-style nationalisation, we may even be talking about nationalising the wrong things. But I'd need to learn a bit more about buses before I went any further. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video about trains and nationalisation. The next and final video in this series will be about capitalism as a whole. Now here's the point where I ask you for a little bit of money. If you want to help support me in making these videos and also writing and some other stuff, then I've started a Patreon, which you can donate to by clicking on the link below. Even if it's a couple of quid a month, I'd be really appreciative. See you next month, guys. In a podcast for the New Economics Foundation, Hillary... That's a hard name to say. Okay. In the podcast for the New Economics Foundation, Hillary... Hillary... Hello, I... <laughs> Hillary Wainwright. Hillary Hillary, 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 in a podcast for the New Economics Foundation, Hillary Wainwright points out that the new... <laughs>